Hello, welcome or welcome back to another video. This week I completed another study of a reference photo using watercolor and color pencil. I spent some time reflecting on what I've learned so far about watercolor, color theory, and tips for beginners. Let's get started. If you've been here before, these materials will be familiar. I use the Faber-Castell 12 pencil polychromo set, the Winsor & Newton Cotman watercolor 12 pan travel set, a white Posca paint pen, and a 2B Tombow pencil, and a Derwent pencil extender. As always, I started by transferring the sketch using a light box. I don't sketch directly on the watercolor paper because erasing on it will destroy the grain and make it harder to paint and render later on. I press harder than I used to because I don't want to lose these lines under the dark washes I know I will be using. From my experience, I know I will be able to cover these graphite lines later with a Posca pen, so the fact that they show in the lighter areas isn't as important. Once I taped down the paper, I began painting with a diluted mixture of yellow ochre, orange, and burnt sienna. In my mini tests, I like the result I got from starting with a warm underpainting. The light falling on the figure in the photo is warm toned, likely an incandescent bulb, which makes all the colors warmer than an LED or fluorescent light would. Establishing this warmth early on helped unify the next washes and kept the skin lifelike in the highlights. After the first layer was completely dry, I laid down the base colors for her dress and hair. White is an interesting shade to render because it picks up on the surrounding colors. I added some of that warmth to the bounce light area, but mixed more blue into most of the dress shadows to create a soft, neutral gray. With such a limited color palette, hue shifts and color temperatures were more important than ever to convey differences in material and color. Even though the white dress was being influenced by its warm surroundings, it should still have cooler shadows than the hair and skin, which have warm local colors. When everything was dry again, I added the hard edges of the shadow pass. In the past, I've been afraid of harsh edges, especially on the smooth planes of the face, but this time I wanted a clear line between light and dark. Even though the colors were much lighter than in the reference, I knew working slowly with multiple layers would give me the most control. I had plenty of time to deepen the values later. This pass was meant only to distinguish light from shadow. For the next layers, I used the same technique as earlier, just with more concentrated, darker pigments to build up the shadows. Let's talk more about color and value as the rest of this footage plays out. I've been using the Cotman travel set for two months now, and I've learned a lot about its quirks and the way it behaves. When I first started using it again, I wondered if only having 12, or more like 11 since I rarely touch the white, colors would hinder my progress. In reality, the limited selection of colors actually helped me. I was forced to mix more colors, do more mini studies, and really study my references to determine hue shifts, which gave me a better understanding of color theory. I had a basic understanding of color mixtures and the differences between warm and cool colors when I first started, but these studies have helped much more than I thought they would. When you're presented with 12 colors, you're forced to learn which mixtures create warm versus cool brown, how to desaturate a color, and color relativity. If I had access to more colors, I wouldn't have gained the mixing knowledge I have now. That's why if I were to start over, I would choose the same palette or maybe even a smaller one. Most watercolor mixing sets start you off with a warm and cool version of the primary colors and nothing else. I admit I've leaned heavily on the browns and ochre in this palette, and removing them would probably force me to understand even more about color theory. However, for other people, only having six colors might be too high of a barrier for entry. If you have very little to no experience with color mixing and color theory, I would recommend this palette. It doesn't have too many colors that would overwhelm a beginner, and what colors are included are versatile for both portraiture and landscape painting. Moving back to the study, I quickly learned that I needed a larger brush to lay down the final washes for the background. The combination of the low relative humidity from winter, and the fact that these paints are pretty thirsty to begin with, made my second to last pass streaky. I didn't want to have to layer a color pencil over the entire background, so I begrudgingly took out my large flat brush and did my best to carve out the silhouette in the final wash. While it's definitely not the best edge control I've ever done, I was still overall happy with the watercolor portion of the study. I managed to capture the temperature shifts from the shadows in the dress to the shadows in the figure, I hadn't destroyed the paper by overblending, and the darks of the background were dark enough, 
which would save me time moving forward. Like last week, I chose to place a study on my 45 degree setup to reduce the chances of messing up the construction of the figure. The first thing I did was clean up the edges. I don't have very good control when using a brush compared to markers and pencils, so there were little areas that needed to be redefined. Besides this, I also needed to cover the graphite underdrawing and the highlights. I did this with a Posca paint pen. After that, I started building form with the pencils. Since polychromos have a harder lead, they are great for tiny details like the ones found in this relatively small study. I made sure to keep the tips of the pencil sharp to maximize the coverage and control. One area that needed help was the back of her head. At some point in the final watercolor layers, the form here was completely lost. I found it again using the burnt ochre to pick out a few locks of hair from the darkness. Other areas needed more contrast, which I added using white, dark brown, and magenta. So far, I have been trying to replicate the reference photo's colors, but now I was ready to add my own spin on this study. I amped up the saturation along the transitions between light and dark, or dark and deeper dark, using orange and magenta. This happens in real life, but I exaggerated the effect on the skin beyond what I saw in the photo. I still wanted more color after that, so I added pale blue along the transition points of the fabric. This made the shadows here feel even colder, which in turn made the skin feel that much warmer. Part of the reason why color theory can be difficult to grasp is color relativity, but if you're aware of it, you can take advantage of it to push your pieces like I did here. Like the watercolor phase, this part involved lots of repeated steps from laying down color to blending it out. Since there's not much to say about techniques, I want to give some thoughts on this piece overall. I think part of the reason why I like the watercolor part this time is because it had such a high contrast between light and shadow from the single light source in the photo. When I first started figure drawing, I worked in grayscale, and in most of my classes we used a single or dramatic light source. This cast harsh shadows and created a clear division between what was in shadow and what was in light, which in turn created form. When you first start drawing, it's hard to notice subtle changes in hue or value from two or three point lighting. Starting from a reference with high contrast allows beginners to understand the planes of the face and how volume works in 3D space easier. This holds true in watercolor as well. Part of my frustration in previous studies came from not being able to recreate subtle detail with a new medium. Since there wasn't as much subtlety in this reference, it was easier to paint and I was happier with the result. While I definitely want to continue working on creating subtlety with watercolor moving forwards, it was nice to have a small win this week. However, there was still a little hiccup in this study. I drew the study at a five by seven inch size. This made it easier to create a flat wash in watercolor and decrease the drying time, but made this part of the process more difficult. While rendering facial features, I was essentially working in a one inch area. This would be difficult even on smooth paper. Cold pressed watercolor paper made capturing tiny details extra hard since I was fighting against the grain of the paper. After trying to render things multiple times, I eventually decided to let the piece stay loose. I've been wanting to create looser paintings in my digital work, so this helped that goal. Instead of trying to get every eyelash right, I focused on making sure the overall forms and values worked. Then, after adding some final touches, I decided the study was done. Here's the final result. I'm happy with how it turned out, and I'm glad I got to practice more with watercolor. I hope this was relaxing or interesting to watch, and as always, I hope you get to create something that brings you joy this week. I'll see you on Friday with the last study on this pad of watercolor paper. Bye!